what I'm going to present today is the uh, general characteristics for cooperative ITS and positioning. And uh, I think that's a very important step, I mean, now to really go from, from uh, I mean, the ideas of the v to v communication to really take it beyond that. And in order to solve that, we need to improve on the positioning. Because it, it's an interplay between what we have at the channel and what we have, I mean, what is the information that we convey? It's not enough with 10 meter accuracy when we uh, are going to report our positions. So uh, what can we do? So what I'm going to do today is uh, talk about a little bit about the, the radio channel, the radio channel that we can use to connect the different vehicles. And then uh, also what are the opportunities that we have in those radio channels and how can you use them for positioning. And then uh, hopefully this afternoon we will hear more about how to really fuse the information between them. So the vehicular radio channel, it's, uh, it's a bit different from what we are used to from the cellular world. I mean, I uh, think here we have uh, a car. This is actually a three days old picture. Uh, we have a platoon here, some uh, trucks, some uh, passenger cars. And uh, it's quite a complicated, one can say. And why is it complicated? Because there everything is moving. Nothing is static. Well, we have some uh, static rails, we have some static trees, but all the other parts in our network, they are moving. And this is the thing that really poses the main challenge to us. Everything is moving. In this scenario, in the uh, highway scenarios, another challenge from a radio point of view is that the number of scatters we have around us is sometimes quite limited. So there are no, as in urban environments, it's a bit hard for the signal to propagate because uh, often we are blocked by large objects. And how can we get the signal to where we want it if we are blocked by large objects and there are no other objects that can act as nice scatterers to really uh, reflect the signal? to where we <coughs> want it. So, the vehicular channels, why are they so different? Well, I mean, they differ in the propagation environment from what we have in the cellular. And also another thing is that often the transmit antenna and the rec receive antenna, they are at the same height. They are at 150 or 3 meters, depending on if it's a passenger car or if it's a truck. This thing means that we are often blocked either by other vehicles or by other objects. And that's something that significantly differs from the typical cellular scenario where you have the uh, base station at 20 meters or so. And then we have the mobility, and the mobility is that the transmitter is moving, the receiver is moving, and many of the scattering points are moving. And this, of course, leads to much higher Doppler frequencies than we have in the cellular world. If we look at the V2I channels, they are somewhat closer to the cellular channels, but still with somewhat uh, lower transmitter heights. And, of course, then we have the more highly dynamic environment. When we talk about the channel and the channel properties, what, what is the channel? I mean, we have a transmit antenna, we have a receive antenna, and then we have something in between. And this is what we typically call here the thing in between, that's what we typically call the propagation channel. So that's the pure diffraction, reflection, uh, transmission process that we have there. But this is not what the modems say. What the modems say, they say the radio channel where we include the antenna at the receive side, we include the antenna at the transmit side. And this is what we refer to as the radio channel. And this radio channel, here we often, I mean, we often distinguish between the path loss shadowing and small scale fading, or large scale fading and small scale fading. And that's known to everybody that has worked with uh, cellular communication or wireless communication. So the path loss is the average um, path loss that we have for a re given distance between the transmit and receiver. And then onto that, we have the shadowing or large scale fading. And what's a little bit uh, different here is that the shadowing is 
often caused by either, I mean, either by other buildings, that's standard, but also by other vehicles. And those vehicles, they tend to, uh, if they have started to block the channel for some time, they tend to stay there. I mean, the whole convoy platoon of vehicles, they are of course moving, but if you look at the relative uh, positions of those objects in the convoy, they tend to be rather static, actually, even though they are moving at 90 kilometers an hour. So if we are started to be shadowed by an object, we usually stay shadowed for some time. And then we have the small-scale fading. And small-scale fading, I mean, it's, uh, the Dopplers are pretty high. But otherwise, I think we have learned from the cellular world that, OK, this one we can take care of. That one I'm not concerned about at all. This one I am, and this one I am. If we now take a closer look at this radio channel, then we have the influence of the antennas. And uh, this is an example how an antenna pattern, or th four different an antenna patterns may look like. Here is a, 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 it's a Volvo, where we have one antenna here, one antenna here, and we have one antenna at the back, and then we have some additional antennas. Uh, and here is how their antenna patterns look like in different directions in the horizontal plane. And as you see, you would expect it to be smooth, and you would expect it to be omnidirectional, at least for this roof antenna here. I mean, you would expect that it sees the environment the same wherever it looks. But that's unfortunately not the case. So what we have is that we have kind of a hedgehog uh, uh, antenna pattern, which means so we have the front of the car in this direction, and uh, we have the front windscreen antenna there. We have the roof antenna, the red one here. And the other reddish is another vehicle with another roof antenna. And then we have the blue one. No, the uh, rear window, the green one. That looks to the back. So depending on where you put this antenna, you can get it to look more to the front, more to the back. But in any case, it won't be omnidirectional. And that has huge implications of the link behavior and of the properties that we see. Because this is also what we see when we try to use those signals for positioning. That if you just turn slightly a few degrees, you can go from one peak here to one fading dip here in the antenna pattern. And then you lose 5 dB, which maybe is not so much. But the same thing happens at the at the other end of the link, and then you can lose 10 dB just by turning the relative positions of the cars by a few degrees. And uh, that's a bit tricky for the system to handle. And if we had the channel before that was quite smooth and clean, then uh, this is also a channel that we might have in between our transmitters and. Uh, and receiver. And now we are sitting here with our transmitter, and then we are trying to see a car coming on this street that you hardly can see, but it's over there. And then you are, you're blocked by this uh, vehicle in front of us. We are not moving that fast. We have a lot of scatterers, parking cars. We have a lot of interesting surrounding uh, objects here. One thing to note is that this wall, which is in all the maps we have, this is a plane wall. Can we expect this to be a plane wall from a radio point of view? No, we can't. And that's also one really important lesson when we talk about positioning and try to use the radio signals for positioning, that things that appear to be plane, they are not plane. I would say that this wall, if you drive here, with two cars, what will happen is that, yes, you will always get nice reflections from this wall. But you will not get it from the point going with you. You will get those nice reflections, sometimes here, sometimes here, sometimes there, sometimes somewhere else. So those scattering points, they are jumping around. And that's 
nothing that you will get out of your ray traces, for example. From this picture, one can also really see uh, some of the challenges that we have in front of us, for especially for multi-link communication, where we want to uh, do cooperative positioning or cooperative driving. That how do you connect to those cars just in front of this truck? And how do you know which way, if you measure the time delay it takes for your signal from the transmit car to the receive car in front, how do you know where the signal, which path the signal takes? And of course, you won't know. So it's a bit tricky to do time delay based uh, positioning in this case. Good thing is that you have a lot of scatterers, and we have to use, learn to how to use those static scatterers to do positioning. So, how do we get non-line of sight signal reception? I mean, if we have a transmit car here and we have a receive car, they are approaching an intersection and then we are blocked either by a big other vehicle or we are blocked by the building, as in this case. And typically, what, or what we can rely on is that we have reflection at either of the buildings. We can have some diffraction. Diffraction is usually what you have in that if you think of that first picture, uh, on the highway, we can usually dif diffract around a big blocking object. But in urban areas, scenarios like this, it's usually more efficient to use the surrounding scatterers, especially this corner over here. That is a corner that is more or less always seen by this vehicle and by these vehicles, unless there are some blocking uh, vehicles in front of us. So, from a signal propagation point of view and to, to establish a link, what we really rely on is those buildings here, there, and there. And then we can also get some, uh, some contributions from the road signs, we can get some contributions from other vehicles, but those tend to be somewhat smaller compared to the contributions that we get from the static buildings in urban scenarios. <coughs> and what determines how much of a signal we get here, of course, it's, I mean, normal physics, it depends on the structure and material that we have in those buildings. And, uh, but also, if we just want to know what is the expected average signal strength that we can get, then we also have to take into account the street widths. The street width here, street width there, and the absolute position, the lateral position on this street. So this is an example with a measured impulse response when we have two vehicles approaching in four-way intersection. It's a time here in seconds. Here we have the impulse response. So what you have here is the signal contributions as a function of distance. Distance should be interpreted as delay in this case. Uh, so what you see here is that they are approaching the intersection and then they get line of sight somewhere here. And you see it gets darker and darker. You get stronger and stronger signal. Back here it's quite weak. What you can rely on is that here yeah, it was a contribution of the van and then it's it's from the road signs and from the buildings. And then, as soon as you get the line of sight, the line of sight is really dominating. So as if you have a line of sight, it's usually much, much stronger than any of the scattered signals. You can use the chairs here if yeah. you want. So let's now look how this uh, might evolve over time. So what, what we're doing is that we are recording those impulse responses. And then, since it was with multiple antennas, we can 
determine the directions of the incoming and outgoing waves, then we can look at what are actually the contributions that we have from the different uh, objects around us. And uh, so what you have here, it's the same time, and then we have the power contribution, relative power contribution of different objects. And we have the dark blue here, it's the buildings, the line of sight, we have traffic, other cars, we have road signs, <coughs> and we have the street lights. And then we have some diffuse or unclassified things as well. What you can clearly see is that if you have the line of sight, it will easily uh, contribute to 50% of the power. <coughs> what you also can see is that we had traffic everywhere. I mean, it was not dense traffic, it was, uh, but you just have a contribution here, but you hardly see any traffic inside the crossing once you've got line of sight. <coughs> now and then you have road signs giving a contribution. If you get the contribution from a road sign, it's usually quite large, but it also tends to disappear quite quickly when you move. And you have the buildings that actually contribute in some way or the other to much of the received power. And if we plot it, take one instance over here, we have the received car there, transmitted car here. So it's a reflection to one building here, reflection to street sign there. We are actually there. Reflection on that truck that happened to be there. Reflection on uh, that street sign. And uh, so it's what you expect. But what I did not expect the first time I saw it was that the contribution of other vehicles was that small. So that was something that surprised me. Uh, if you have large vehicles, they might act as good reflectors, scatterers. But standard vehicles, you don't get too much of them, actually. If we just look at the, the influence of those vehicles, so what we have here is a four-way intersection. And we now have the time here and how the channel gain evolves over time when this vehicle and this vehicle is approaching the intersection. This is a four-way intersection with buildings all around. And if we look at the received power level, now it's for two different antenna combinations. You see, as you expect, it goes from something low and then it gets higher and higher the closer to the intersection you are. And here we are reaching the line of sight. And from there, then the line of sight starts to dominate, and we get the nice and stable signal power. If we now take another intersection, where we remove those buildings, we have an open intersection, still being blocked by this particular big uh, building over here. And then we do the same thing. We make another measurement, and we compare the power level that we get here to the power level that we get there, you see that especially here in the non-line of sight where we are blocked by the building, you have quite a severe signal degradation, as expected, because there is nothing here that actually can contribute to the signal power to the car just on the si other side of the building. <coughs> Okay, from there, we can now look a little bit more closer into the impulse responses that we can uh, record. So it's the same four-way intersection. We have the time here. We have the delay here, or the propagation distance. And then we have the impulse responses that we can record. And you can see some interesting patterns in this one. So this is for the four-way intersection with the buildings. This is the four-way intersection with only one building. And you can see it's much more dense here. We have many more multipath components. Here, uh, it's, of course, less dense. But another interesting thing or those lines that we have here. What are those? And those are actually something that goes in the other direction compared to everything else. 
So here we are, the two vehicles, they are approaching each other. But for those, they are actually, here the delay is increasing while the vehicles are approaching each other, which means that it's, it's a signal that goes behind us and then, and then to the other vehicle. And those can be very, very efficient if we want to do multi-path assisted positioning. Because then we have scatterers around us and we can actually use those scatterers as virtual transmitters. Which, and then we have many transmitters around us and then those can be used for positioning in a very efficient way. <coughs> so let's take another close look at the uh, impulse responses that we see. So now it's a highway scenario. We have a receiver car here. We have a transmitter car driving here. We have some factory buildings. Otherwise, it's quite open environment. We are driving at 90 kilometers an hour. And if we now look at the impulse response versus time. So now we have the time going in this direction. We have the delay going here. We are starting here. It's basically line of sight between the two vehicles. So the line of sight, we have a decreasing and decreasing delay until they pass each other and then it's increasing again. And now it's a little bit hard for you to see in this light, but here we have a banana shape. And uh, also what we have here that is more visible on my screen is that we have some of those other weak components that I talked about before. And now we can think of what are those components actually, and we see it's a line of sight component here. <coughs> those ones, they are actually contributions from those factory buildings that we had beside the road. And those other lines here, they are scattering from other vehicles. And for positioning, we can now use all those things. We can use the scattering because we have a quite a good distance measure to those uh, factory buildings at the side. And we have quite a good relative speed measurements to those other cars. And we also have quite a good uh, distance estimate to those other cars. And uh, those are really nice signals that we should use for positioning if we want to go beyond what we can get with a GPS only. And if we look at the Doppler contributions, so what we have here is the Doppler frequency versus delay. And uh, now we took one time instant at five seconds, maybe I should go back, so we are here now, where we have a little bit of the scattering from the factory buildings, we have a little bit of scattering from the other cars, and we have the line of sight. And if we identify it so that the vehicles, they are driving against each other, we have uh, a Doppler component here at just below 1,000 hertz, which correspond to relative velocity of 180 kilometers an hour, as expected. But this is something that also differs from what we have in cellular systems, that in vehicle communication we can easily get up to four times the individual velocities in relative Doppler. And then we have the scattering at factory buildings. Uh, now we're approaching it a little bit so that we get 500 hertz Doppler. And then we have scattering at the other cars, and then we actually get a negative one. It, it means that it's, in this scenario, it's something reflecting that, uh, that is a little bit behind. So, this was now what we have in the radio channel at the vehicle side. So let's now look at some cellular trends that I think that you're all aware of. That, I mean, what, what are the current trends that we have in 5G that will also affect the way we can do positioning and affect the possibilities that we have for radio-based position? 
I mean, what we have one uh, trend number one here we are going small cells. More and more cells, mainly indoor, and uh, we'll also have much more access points around us. We are moving to higher frequencies, so we are targeting millimeter wave communication. Currently, after the World Radio Conference previous year, it's quite clear that the world will go 28 gigahertz for cellular millimeter wave coverage. It will not be 60. I mean, we have nice systems at 60 gigahertz, where we wireless LAN systems. But for the more cellular systems, it will go 28. That I'm pretty convinced of. There, we need antenna arrays and beam steering for those systems to work. And then we have the other trend, the massive MIMO, where we use conventional cellular frequencies and we focus the energy to some specific spatial points in the environment where we have the users. And this is all based on instantaneous channel information. So, if we now think of positioning and millimeter waves, how, how does it actually affect us? And uh, looking at it, I mean, for millimeter wave, you can rely on line of sight or single reflections. And you have to use those. I mean, you cannot use the diffuse scattering that we have at the lower frequency because it's simply not there. So it's a more sparse channel that we have. A good thing looking at it is we have a much wider bandwidth, so which will help us from a positioning point of view because we just get a much better time resolution compared to what we have with the either the 11p or with the standard cellular frequencies. Beamforming is necessary, and beam steering is necessary. Uh, and that is actually good for us, because it will decrease the dense multipath. From a positioning point of view, using radio-based signal, dense multipath is a killer because it act, acts as just noise for the positioning signals. What's really affect us from a positioning point of view is the level of the discrete scatterers to the level of this disturbance level that we have by the determined by the dense multipath. And with beamforming and millimeter waves, since we have lower levels of dense multipath, and we have the beamforming, it will actually be easier to do good positioning with millimi using millimeter waves. But from a, it's really a nightmare from a vehicle point of view. I mean, if we have vehicles driving 100 kilometers an hour in one direction and then in another direction, and then you have to do beam steering with an object that is jumping around, and uh, I, I mean, sometimes you can, uh, you are a fixed space station and then you have to follow the vehicle. That's really a challenge. And even worse is the challenge to have two vehicles using millimeter wave communicating with each other. But it's something that is talked about. So uh, maybe we'll see it, but it's really, really a hassle. From a positioning point of view, it's really nice because it will just go in our hands. It will give nice, distinct signals with good delay resolution and low dense multipath levels. Taking the next trend, densification, how does it affect us? Of course, more base station, more access points. We have more anchors. That's really nice. We have more fixed points in our environment that we can relate to. And usually we know the position of those fixed points. And that's really good for us. Many of those cells, however, they will pl be placed indoors and we are usually driving outdoors. So the strength of those signals will be quite weak. And if you look at modern buildings like this one, if you place an access point in here, it's a very, very high attenuation that we have through modern glass building materials. So the signal strength that we have out there from access point in here is quite small. Another interesting trend, especially for Wi-Fi, two-way time of flight is coming. And it's giving us at least a meter accuracy. 
And that is something that I think can be even more used in the vehicular world. <coughs> and in general, synchronization is a hassle for the small cells. But if we look at the outer pico base station, pico base stations, they really provide nice signals of opportunities for positioning purposes. They are transmitting known signals now and then regularly. We know where they are. We usually have good line of sight to those and uh, definitely think that those should be used for positioning. Then the third trend, Messi MIMO. Uh, good thing with Messi MIMO is, yes, we do have a lot of antennas, but as opposed to millimeter wave, there is no explicit beamforming. So we cannot talk about anymore that we are transmitting in this direction or that direction. We use the instantaneous channel information to make sure that all the signals that they add up constructively where we want it. But we never talk about angles. We never talk about directions. We don't know where the users are. An interesting thing is that it's actually possible to trade bandwidth versus antennas and still maintain a good pos delay accuracy, but with less bandwidth and more antennas. From a communication point of view, we have this channel hardening effect, which actually is very good for us. But that is only between the base stations and the units where we are communicating. If we think of cooperative device-to-device -device positioning, we cannot gain anything from those massive MIMO benefits. We will not get the channel hardening there. The channel hardening will, will uh, appear only between the base station and the intended uh, users. Another good thing is that since we are using conventional cellular frequencies, for Massive MIMO, it will actually give us manageable Doppler shifts for the applications that we think of. So, with those in mind, let's now think, take a step back to the vehicular world again and the multi-link behavior. <coughs> and multi-link behavior is really what we need to understand in order to build up a network and the network we need to do cooperative positioning. And I would say when talking about networks of nodes, it's really important to have some kind of geometry-based model behind the simulation. Because what's, as you have understood, the line of sight and non-line of sight or obstructed line of sight, it's really important that we can distinguish those. And they will actually give correlation between the link behaviors. If we don't take the geometrical information into account, we need to consider cross-correlations between all the links because they tend to be shadowed pairwise or shadowed together. If we have a, for example, think of a platoon, if we have a big truck in the platoon and the other vehicles are passenger cars, of course, if the truck is there, it tends to not shadow car number Two, it shadows car number three and four and five as well when trying to communicate with uh, vehicle number one. So I would say from a communication point of view, do distinguish geometrically between line of sight, obstructed line of sight, and then those correlations will be taken care of automatically. Let's look at some example. This is a convoy with four passenger cars, and we are communicating between this and this, that and that, and that and that, and all the combinations that we can think of. And if we look at the obstructed line of sight, now <coughs> we usually distinguish between obstructed and non-line of sight. With obstructed line of sight, we mean obstructed by the vehicles. With non-line of sight, we usually refer to the fact that we are shadowed by a building or some very large object. For the obstructed line of sight, we can use conventional power flux model where we have a reference level and then we have a propagation uh, exponent 
that is determined by the environment. We have a distance relation. And then we have log normal shadow fading. So that's pretty conventional. What we need to take into or keep in mind is when actually deriving those propagation exponents and the losses here, we also have to consider that when we are measuring, we tend to be measure quite often below the noise threshold. Or if we are measuring with delivered packets, we tend to, or we can only measure signal strengths where we actually receive packets. Usually we are quite often below the noise threshold or we are missing those packets. And then we have to take those into account when deriving those parameters. Otherwise we will end up in a too optimistic model. For the line of sight, usually what we have is a quite dominant two path behavior. So that we have the line of sight and then we have some reflection in the road there. And those two components, they tend to be out of phase. So they cancel each other. And they cancel each other when this uh, distance here and that distance differs by half a wavelength and multiples of that. And uh, that will di give a very distinct behavior. And it will give fading dips, also in line of sight. And it will be determined by the height of this vehicle, the height of this vehicle, and the antenna characteristics that we have at the two sides. And you can uh, think of what you would get, and it will look like this. It's not so complicated as it might look. But there are some parameters from a measurement point of view. We need to identify and estimate how is the reflection coefficient and the phase behavior here. And we need to know the height of the different vehicles. And, uh, but once done, we should just make sure to implement it in our simulators. Because we should not take for granted that line of sight is always nice and easy, because there will be some certain distances where those two cancel each other. And we get a very bad signal, even though it's line of sight between two vehicles. <coughs> this is how signal strength as a uh, function of distance may look like. And as you say, it's a cloud. And so the deviation, here is the uh, expected uh, path loss that we have. And as you see, the deviation from this expected value is quite high. And one, I mean, two important things is the antenna pattern. As we described before, I mean, just the relative angular change of the vehicles, that can give you plus minus 5 dB in signal strength on either side. And then we have the shadowing effect, and then we have our, all the other random behavior. And here you can also see the difference that, I mean, you can see that there is a quite a clear floor here, that we cannot measure signal strength below here. And if we just take the successful packets into account, we will end up with a model with ordinary least square as the blue one here. If we take, into the, take the fact into account that we actually know that we had missing packets over here, they were below the noise threshold. We don't know where, but we know that they are here somewhere. We know also the distances between the vehicles. If we take this into account and make better estimate of the path loss, we will end up with a black line here. And you see that the blue one is a bit too optimistic. So we really should consider this one. This is an example how it may look like for a single link, uh, line of sight, obstructed line of sight. If you just look at the blue ones, you can see, especially here, this oscillating behavior that we have due to the line of sight, uh, due to the two path behavior. And if we try to uh, extract those parameters and do the parameter estimation, we end up with the green model here with confidence intervals like this. And we do the same for this obstructed line over here. Now, taking this, and then we from here, we look at the 
correlation that we have, the autocorrelation that we have for the shadowing process, and the cross-correlation that we have between the different links. And if we just go with a standard, we don't consider if we are in line of sight, non line of sight, or whatever, we just extract one single path loss model. This is the autocorrelation function that we will we'll end up with. <coughs> the green and the red, they are different vehicles, and it's with line of sight and non line of sight. And as you see, the autocorrelation is quite high, and we have a unit here. So in the order of 10 seconds, I mean, we have not even reached the autocorrelation 0.5. So if we are shadowed, we tend to stay shadowed. Now, if we distinguish between line of sight and non-line of sight, so that we have that in the model, what you see is that the autocorrelation time actually goes down. What we do here is that we have one path loss model for all the uh, obstructed line of sight and one for the all the non-line of sight users. And if we take this one step further, and we take the two-ray model for line of sight and single slope obstructed line of sight model, individual links, then you see that now the correlation, the time correlation has gone down because we are capturing those correlation effects with the fact that we distinguish between and that we have a good model for the obstructed line of sight. So this is where I would suggest that where we end up, that we geometrically distinguish obstructed line of sight or uh, line of sight, and then we have an autocorrelation time in an order of one or two seconds, which is reasonable. And uh, in the cellular world, we often use a uh, negative exponential to model this autocorrelation. Same can be done. But what we also have to consider is, again, uh, the antenna pattern. And the antenna pattern, if we compare two antennas at the same car, and here we have, with the shadow fading, with the vehicle behind us with one antenna, and with, with the other antenna. You would expect that those shadow fadings uh, that the levels, that they are the same, but they are not, and that's due to the antenna pattern. And hence, we have to consider the influence of the antenna pattern. So, from that, I think we uh, conclude and go to the... Two more things. Scattering behavior. So this is another measurement <coughs> where we have the transmitter driving from here. We have the receiver driving from here. And now we look at the individual behavior of the multipath components that we can extract. This is now a UWB measurement, so we have a very good time resolution in this measurement. If we look at the impulse responses that we have, we have the time here, we have the delay in nanoseconds. We would expect nice lines here. And we can see lines, but what we also can see is that those lines, they actually, they come and go. And that is due to this effect that I talked about before, that a wall is not a plain wall where the scattering point is moving, but the scattering point is jumping around. And this has very significant uh, or very big importance when we're trying to use those for multipath assisted positioning. And it's another example here. And what you can say is, I mean, if we look at this contribution that we have, it's coming and it's going, and then it's coming and gets stronger and stronger and stronger. We can use it, and this one is alive for roughly 0.3 seconds. But that is some of the components, they are alive for, for a few seconds. But some com components, they are only there for a very short time which is something that we have considered for the position. Okay, let's now 
with that conclude and go to the channel models. So what, what I think for positioning that we really should consider is the some kind of geometry based uh, channel model because that will both capture the things important for positioning as well as for communication. And uh, here is a highway scenario. We have one vehicle there, one vehicle there. We have some uh, other reflecting objects. And this is the recorded impulse response that we have in this scenario. And if we look at how it changes over time, if we look at this, especially we have the line of sight, and you can see how it's moving while the cars are driving. And we can also see the other discrete components. And they actually can help a lot from a radio-based positioning point of view. And now let's uh, now they're going back. And we see how the delay is increasing, increasing. Components, they are coming and going. We saw those other small things. And those things you actually have in the geometry-based stochastic models. The alternative, or such a geometry-based ch channel model, I mean, we have the vehicles, we have some diffuse parts, we have some static discrete scatterers, and that is what we actually can use, both for communication as well as for position. The alternative, I would say, is to use ray tracing. Ray tracing is also very good, both from a communication perspective as well as from a positioning perspective. And then we are evaluating all the possible paths in that more realistic environment. And uh, we have done some comparisons between real world measurements and ray tracing. And what you can see is that you capture the line of sight and the first and second order reflections very well. What's a little bit more tricky with the ray tracers is to get a good representation of this dense multipath that we have there, because it still captures some directional characteristics. But uh, with that and remembering the fact that scatterers, they are not alive the whole time. They come and go, and they move. Or they are static, but they change from time to time where they are located. With that, I, I would say that ray traces or geometry-based channel models. They are really something that should be considered both from communication as well as for positioning. And with that, I would uh, say thanks. And uh, also, of course, this is not something that I've come up with myself. But uh, so thanks to all cooperation partners and uh, current and the former PhD students. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.